Godly Parenting, Part 2, Lesson 3, A Father's Responsibility. So now, just because we're talking about the Father's Responsibility doesn't mean, mothers, you get to sit back and take your ease or just enjoy this lesson of beating up on fathers. This is where we you know, see how the Father's role is important, but also maybe how you can help. When you know the expectation of the Father, you can help Him as His help meet to be able to accurately father, be accurately parent, and you can know what is the father's role, what is your role, but also for the fathers listening today and enjoying this lesson with us, we know that we are to be responsible for our children because God gives them to us for a purpose and a reason. He doesn't just say, well, I'll just kind of throw these, these you know, souls or these spirits, I'll just throw them out there and just let them fall where they land. No, no, God is more... Uh, precise than that. God is more, he's smarter than that. He gives us specific children for specific reasons. Amen. So God instituted marriage and family, period. God instituted it. So it should not be a surprise. It should not surprise us, excuse me. Then when that his Bible includes many examples, both good and bad of parenting. All Bible stories seem to indicate that parenting begins with the father. I'll say that again. All Bible stories seem to indicate that parenting begins with the father. So what happens when the father is lazy? The parenting doesn't really take place. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't begin or maybe it takes a back seat and becomes second rate to something else. So it's important for the fathers to be the beginning of that parenting. It's important for the fathers to have a part in that. You can look at statistics in, in any kind of race, any nationality. When the father is not present, there's usually issues. When the father is not present, there's usually issues. And not only for the mother to be a single mom or whether she's, you know, the father's always away and the, maybe he's still connected to the family, but he goes away for different things and then comes back just ever so often. There's still issues because the father is not present and doing his duty as a father. So it's important for fathers to get this right. Doesn't mean we're expected to be perfect, but we give it our best effort. We do it heartily unto God. So the Old Testament begins with fathering. As is alluded to by Cain and Abel, knowing how to worship God in Genesis. So if, if they, when we catch the story of Cain killing Abel, of course, when they're presenting their offerings unto God, somebody taught them how to do that. Somebody taught them, this is how you honor God. This is how you walk with God. Because if, if nobody did, how did they both at the same time know what to do unto God? And apparently it's not their first one because they're not being taught. It doesn't say that Adam and Eve are walking with them, teaching them and showing them. So obviously they've been taught enough, discipled enough that they are doing it themselves. So with that kind of understanding, this you can see that the fathering, because Adam walked with God, even though the, the fall of man took place, Adam walks with God, so he teaches his boys how to walk with God. But that doesn't mean that both of them are perfect at it either. But we can see this alluded to by Cain and Abel, knowing how to worship God in Genesis and ends with fathering again in Malachi. So Malachi 4, 6 says, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Successful parenting demands a father's heart and a vision that looks 10 years down the road. Ten years down the road at least. So we've got to have a father's heart and a vision, not just to see, well, this Friday or see, you know, this Saturday or to see this Sunday. We've got to have a vision that sees further than that to how to, how to maneuver our children, how to get them where God wants them to be so that when they reach the age where they leave the father and mother's home, that they're, they are well set up to be successful in the things of God, to be successful in life. But if you don't have that kind of vision, then you will set them up for failure. So we've got to have that kind of vision, but also have the heart in it. Because you can do a work, oh, I guess I better teach them this, I guess I better teach them that. Why not enjoy those moments and have that heart to be connected with your child and to be able to set them up and have a vision for them? I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. If you're going to do it, you might as well do it with the right heart. Amen. 
But successful parenting demands, it demands, it doesn't suggest, it demands a father's heart and a vision that looks 10 years down the road. Very few mothers have difficulty taking interest in their children. Now, notice it doesn't say all, because there's a few that... That, that I know that their interest is taking pictures and putting it on Facebook and taking pictures and bragging on their child, but that's about as much interaction as they get with their mother because their mother is so self-absorbed and focused on themselves that they want to live vicariously through their children. Oh, look what my child's doing. Look what my child's doing. Look at the time we're having. Look what we're doing. Look what we had for dinner. Nobody cares what you had for dinner. I mean, for something to go in your mouth for a few hours to go in your body and then come out as waste, nobody cares. But if that's the only interaction you have with your child is just to show off what they're doing, show off who you are maybe even forcing them to be, that's not good parenting. Parenting sets them up for life to to have success, to walk with their God, to know their God, to be a good spouse one day, to be a good parent one day, to know exactly what God has told us from the Bible to live and how to do. So, But if we don't, then we fail as parents. So very few mothers have difficulty taking interest in their children. So more than likely, not always, as we just said, but more than likely mothers will have more of an interest because of that motherly instinct, that motherly love towards that child. I mean, when you think about it, they've already got a connection because they carried the child within them for so many months and then gave birth to them. So they're going to have that connection already and take interest in them. But it is the father's who typically struggle to stay focused on the welfare and discipleship of their children. So I'm going to say that again. It is the fathers who typically struggle to stay focused on the welfare and discipleship of their children. Now, it's kind of a running joke. You can see it sometimes between fathers, sometimes in TV shows and movies. But, you know, you get a mom, you know, they're focused on what the child eats, how the child's taken care of, how they're dressed, are they clean, are they, you know, this and that. And you get a father who watches them, and maybe the mother's going shopping or going and getting the groceries or whatever the case may be, and you leave them with the father, the father's just like, okay, yeah, you know, are you bleeding? Are you okay? All right, well, you're good then. And then it's like, you know, having to camp out in the living room, swinging from the chandeliers, I mean, just all kinds of things. But as long as nobody's hurt and nobody's dying, everybody's good. I mean, that's just kind of the running joke, but it's kind of the truth as well. Because the father is just like, eh, as long as, they're ha- as long as they're having fun, they're all right. You know, they're okay. But we, we as fathers, not that we have to be dictators in that regard, but we should be more involved in the discipleship and the well-being, the welfare of our children. Yeah. Amen. Because there's going to come a time to where, you know, even if you have the children swinging on the chandeliers, and then all of a sudden the chandelier breaks and the father gets upset. Why did you break my chandelier? Well, father, why did you let him swing on it? <laughs> so you got to be able to see these things ahead of time. Amen. So when fathers fail in parenting, mothers are crippled in their role. We'll say that again. When fathers fail to lead in parenting, mothers are crippled in their role. Because a mother cannot fill for father's role. Now, you, know, you take single parents and things, they try to do the best they can, but there is even scientific evidence as well as spiritual evidence as well as just watching it take place. A, that woman, the, the mother, cannot fulfill the father's role. She cannot be the father and the mother. Although she takes on that responsibility and does the best she can, it doesn't mean she's successfully being the father to that child as well. It takes both. But when you have the father leave the mother, he doesn't, he doesn't lead in that, but he leaves her to lead it, leads her to do it, whether he's in the picture or out of the picture, then the mother is going to be crippled in that role. Fathers must arise and disciple their children. That is the heart of what is, has went so wrong in our nation and in the world is because fathers have quit fathering. They have sired, which means they put things where sometimes it belonged, sometimes it didn't belong, birthed a child, but then just said, I'm done. I'm all done. I have my fun. Now I'm done. And that's not right. To father a child, you must accurately accurately disciple them and to help them, lead them, guide them, and raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's technically, if we look at Scripture and we 
look at that verse accurately, that's the Father's role. It's to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. To help them to understand the things of God. But the fathers must arise and disciple their children. So parenting problems in the Bible. The Bible contains very few examples of decent parenting. The failure of most parenting is tied directly to the fathers. So Job enabled his kids uh, profligacy. So Job 1, 4 through 6, which that word profligacy means uh, wildly extravagant or shamelessly immoral. So he's the one that allowed them to be wildly extravagant. He's the one that allowed them to be shamelessly immoral. So they were immoral, but they were shamelessly immoral. You can be, I know some people, when they're, when they're immoral, they feel bad about it. They feel the shame. They feel the weight of it. Then there's others who do it. They could care less. You could tell them, hey, what you're doing is wrong. I don't really care. I like doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. That's shamelessly immoral. Israel failed to circumcise for 40 years. <laughs> this was a major parenting fail. Moses even failed to force the, the issue of circumcision with his two sons, Exodus 4, 24 and 26. Now, the reason this is a failure is because this was a commandment from God. So to have God specifically say, this is what you do. Now, we can say, yeah, man, those, those children of Israel, man, Moses and all of them, they need to get their act together. They need to obey God. God still speaks today. God gives us his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit. We know the seven leadings of God we actually just covered in Sunday school before we come to Godly Parenting too. But with that, we know the seven leadings, the way that God still speaks to us and leads us in things. So to say that, you know, they need to get their act together, maybe we should get our act together. And that we hold up the commandments of God in our lives, in our kids' lives, in our grandkids' lives, even our spiritual children's lives. That we don't fail God in that regard, but we do what he's commanded us to do. And even here, with Israel failing for 40 years. It wasn't like they failed, you know, oh man, we should have done this. They failed for 40 years. That's, that's kind of a bold, disrespectful rebellion. To do it for 40 years. And then to have Moses, the man of God, not follow through. That's saying something as well. But Moses' grandson, Jonathan, became a Levite for hire and helped create a cult in the tribe of Dan. Judges 18, verses 30 and 31. But notice he became a Levite for hire. So that's a priest. That's a priest for hire. It's a, it's a hireling, is what we would say. Amen. So we can see, even with spiritual fathers, if they don't teach their spiritual sons in the faith that are maybe ministers, things of that nature, if they don't teach them and accurately father them in the spirit, I know a lot of this applies to the natural, but can also apply to spiritual. But if a, a spiritual father doesn't accurately disciple his, his men of God or the men he's raising up, then what, what is produced is hirelings in the churches, hirelings as leaders hirelings as, as pastors, preachers, and makeshift five-fold ministers that may not be ordained of God, but because they haven't been taught anybody, they haven't been discipled, or maybe on the flip side of that, they haven't submitted themselves to be discipled. They are in rebellion to their spiritual parents. You've got a break in that command. You've got a break in that the way God established things. And so it leads to all kinds of confusion and chaos. But when it's done biblically and done correctly, then a father, whether spiritual or natural, will accurately disciple his children, and the children will be, will be more accurate in what their walk with God is and what they're to do, and then they will accurately disciple their children, and it keeps getting passed down to generation to generation. So, son, so Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, mocked, worshipped, and died. Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2. So I noticed they mocked worship and they died. But that should have been taught. That should have been taught. We don't mock worship. We actually worship God. We, give, we worship Him. Of course, for us now, we worship in spirit and in truth. But Aaron should have taught his two sons how to worship and not die. So Eli's sons, Phineas and Hophni, 
They were, per, they were perverts, stealing the tithe and fornicating with the worshipers. So 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 17 and verse 22. So this also happens when you have spiritual fathers who don't do their job as well. You have Eli's sons, because Eli was, he was the, the priest. He was supposed to have been the one in charge of everything to bring up his sons as the next generation of priests to be able to run the house of God. But that's not the way that it happened. What happened is he let them be perverted, so God sends Samuel. And so Samuel, he raises him up decent. He raises him up pretty good. Samuel wasn't perfect either, but you also got to look at who his spiritual father was. So the spiritual fathering obviously was there to some degree in Eli because he perverted his judgment with his own boys, but he accurately, for the most part, discipled Samuel. So it wasn't about he didn't have the opportunity to have the knowledge because he had, we could say, technically three sons. He raises one pretty decent. The other two he lets become perverts because they're his little darlings. They're his little blessings. <laughs> That's what happens when you pervert your judgment. You, you breed perverts. Amen. So that shouldn't be. We need to accurately disciple. Samuel's sons were greedy and corrupt. So the, the discipleship and the, we could say the Goliath, as we talked about last week, from Eli passed through Samuel, not in the same way it did through Phineas and, and Hophni, but it passed to another, another way through Samuel to allow his sons to be greedy and corrupt. So that's 1 Samuel 8, verses 3 through 5. So David had two sons who grew up to be sexual perverts. Amnon, it's 2 Samuel 13, and Solomon, 1 Kings 11, 1. And one son who was an insurrectionist, Absalom, 2 Samuel 15, 6. Now notice who, had, who started the sexual perversion? David with Bathsheba. So he bred that into two of his sons, which one became one of the became the wisest king that would come for God's people, but yet he had that same Goliath that wasn't killed with David. Because David had that moment of giving in to that, allowing that, but obviously it wasn't handled completely properly or discipled through his children accurately because it got that discipleship lacking discipled Solomon because Solomon was supposed to be the wisest one so if he had the wisdom you would think oh well, I got the wisdom I can see this because I know what happened to my father but obviously that discipleship was wasn't there so he didn't give in to that wisdom or didn't allow that wisdom to minister to him but he also had one son who was an insurrectionist so to rise up which which in our minds, we should think, well, David should know better because he didn't rise against Saul even when Saul was trying to kill him. David had many opportunities to kill Saul and proved it to him. That, hey, I could have killed you, but I didn't because I'm still honoring you. So where was that discipleship? Because obviously David had it in him, but he didn't disciple it to his own son because his own son did the exact same thing well, it did the exact opposite of what David did to Saul. He rose up trying to take him out, trying to take his kingdom from him. So we can see that it, it all boils down to discipleship and being the father of taking what you know is, is right in you, what's wrong in you, and, uh, and applying it to your, to your lineage to teach them, hey, this is wrong. I've had to deal with this. This is how you overcome it. This is what I've done. The Lord's shown me. I've, I've been blessed in it because I'm... Right with God in this area, so this is how you continue to do this. And so to have that discipleship, you pass it down so that they can be accurate. So good parenting in the Bible. Oddly enough, King Saul was not biased. What? King Saul, the one who gave in to the people, the one who, who, who didn't listen to God, he disobeyed God? You mean he's our first example of a godly parent? Wow. It's, it's sad that he could be not biased in his, uh, in his parenting with Jonathan, but yet not use that own boldness or courage to come against the people and to stand for himself. Because he condemned himself. Now, granted, he condemned his lineage as well, but when it came to it, if he's not biased with his own son, 
Because even this says, we'll finish reading this sentence. It says, oddly enough, King Saul was not biased. He was hard on, on his favored son, Jonathan. So he was hard on him. Because he, he knows, I've got to raise this guy, raise this boy right. I've got to raise him up the way that he should be raised. But when it came to judgment of having a, a mob angry at him or having a crowd not pleased with him, then he chose to listen to the people. Even though he didn't give in to the face of his son, he gave in to the face of the people. And we can't do that as parents because it, as parents, we've got to allow our face to be like flint against wrong, against sin, that we don't change our mind against sin and what is wrong, but we hold that line to say, this is wrong, I love you, I'm going to show you what's right, I'm going to show you how to correct this in your life, I'm going to show you what right looks like and what wrong looks like, so you can be an accurate disciple that you may go further than I did. So to, so to have this, I, I thought was really Really odd, I never thought about it before. You know, you read these verses and things, but never think about it in that context. Was that King Saul was not biased. Amen. Manoah was one of the greatest dads in the Old Testament, Judges 13. Asaph, one of David's least likely worship leaders, raised up his sons to maintain the vision of temple ministry for generations. Not just one, but generations. His lineage was still serving God in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. That's a lineage. That's some, some discipleship was taught and taught accurately for Asaph to be able to teach his children. They had to teach their children to pass that down all the way through Ezra and Nehemiah's time. That's some true discipleship. Some true, you know, let me, let me be inconvenienced to help disciple you. Would to God more parents would do that today. Instead of, well, I, you mean I got to get off Facebook to actually parent you? I got to get off Facebook to do this. I got to get off this to do that. I got to do this, put myself aside to, to help you. If we have that attitude, why even have the child in the first place? If you can't appreciate and love that child and spend time with that child, then we shouldn't have had that child in the first place. Amen. So... Not to say that nobody should have children, saying that if you're going to have one, be prepared to take the time with that child, disciple that child, and to spend the necessary time to raise it up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So Joseph was the reason Mary was chosen. Whoa, wait a minute. That would, that would make a Catholic's mind just... Because <laughs> it's all about Mary. It's all about me. No, no, no. Joseph was the reason Mary was chosen. He raised Jesus in the law of Moses. Because we think of you know, you know, Mary being so holy and so pure, which she was, but you got to remember, she was already espoused to Joseph. And so if Joseph was the man of God, if, if God knew, all right, Joseph, he's going to raise my son, Jesus, he's going to raise him up the way that I need him to be raised, then essentially if he's already espoused to Mary, then that is going to follow suit. But he had to do it before everything came to pass, before they come to know each other, or it would have been taken or seen as Joseph's son, his biological son. But it was that connection from Joseph to Mary which made her chosen. Successful parenting doesn't require a drill instructor's hard nose nor an OCD control issue. Amen. It requires a diligent, watchful, tender eye and the willingness to put in the time necessary to train and nurture the child into God-honoring early adulthood. So I'm going to say that again. It requires a diligent, watchful, tender eye and the willingness to put the time necessary to train, to put in the time necessary to train and nurture the child into god Honoring early adulthood. That is why we have so many children, especially in today's society, that have not been able to do what they need to do or see themselves and are all self-absorbed and selfish because their parents lacked a diligent, watchful, tender eye with a willingness to put in the time. So when you don't do that, you raise up the child of saying, here, go do this. Here, go do this. Here, entertain yourself with this. Here, entertain yourself with that. 
And so the child looks for to please themselves. They look for something to do because their parent is pushing them away. Now, I'm not, not saying that you, you can't do your job, you can't do things like that. That's understandable. But if you do that 99% of the time, you're pushing your child away, telling them to go entertain themselves, then eventually they're going to quit coming to you and they're going to be self-absorbed because they're like, well, I've got to focus on myself anyway. I've got to entertain myself. I've got to raise myself. I've got to do whatever for myself. And so that breeds into their adulthood to where all they think about is themselves. They don't look at everybody else. They don't, they don't walk with anybody else. They're focused on themselves. So that breeds that over and over and over. So God, as a reasonable parent or father, we need, look, we need not look any further than to God as a role model in parenting. How, how does he teach us, correct us, admonish us, or punish us? Consider how the Heavenly Father parents us. The Father demonstrates perfect parental emotions. I'm going to say that again. The Father demonstrates perfect parental emotions. Now, for us parents, us grandparents, spiritual parents, we need to take note of these verses because you know, we can many times get wrapped up in emotions because there's so many other things going on that we can allow our emotions to get out of control when something else goes on with our kids. But we got to also remember that whether it's our spiritual children or grandchildren or our natural children, that it, many things that has went on out through our day is not their fault. So we must use God, the Father, we must use His parental emotions and apply it to our life. So Psalm 103 verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger. Notice it doesn't say He doesn't get angry. It says He's slow to anger. So that means that there is a time where you can push God enough that he'll get angry. But he's slow to it. Doesn't mean he just flies off the handle. So for us, even as Christians, to apply this to ourselves, because maybe you know our father was, had different emotions, or maybe our mother had different emotions, we must see accurately our father and what the scripture says about him. Because many times, how we view our parents is how we'll view God. And that, nine times out of ten, is going to sell God short. Because maybe because we know our, our parents weren't perfect, because you know, maybe they were really good to us, maybe we had a great childhood, but still there was some area where they weren't perfect, and we still apply that to God. But we've got to apply how we view God. We've got to get that from the Scripture. Amen. So the Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. When Adam and Eve rebelled, the all-knowing God of creation began to help them by asking a series of questions. Man's honest answers brought him back into some form of fellowship. Notice it was his honest answers. It wasn't his guile trying to make himself look good. It was his honest answers that brought him, brought him back into some form of fellowship. That's what God wants. That's, that's exactly, to, even today, what God wants from his children is when we mess up and he says, you know, Caleb, where are you? Right here I am, Lord. And just use myself as an example. And, and it's one of those things to where we got to be honest. Lord, I'm standing behind this bush. I'm standing behind this tree because I did this wrong. But it was, but notice as we see this man's honest answers brought him back into some form of fellowship. It was because Adam Although they kind of played this escape game where they Adam blamed the Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and then God punished all three of them. If we just leave that part out to say, I'm not, I'm not making excuses, I'm not blaming anybody else, I did this, it was wrong, so help me, God, that restores our fellowship with Him. That will restore our fellowship. Even when we've done wrong, if we're honest about it and talk to Him about it, it brings, it restores our fellowship with Him. So God responds to our mistakes and rebellion with mercy and grace. But that's only if you're open and honest with him. The longer you hide it, the more he's going to say, all right, well, I, I can't bless you because you're lying to me. I can't bless you because you're, you're, you're walking away from me. You haven't restored our fellowship. You've broken it off. 
But when we're open and honest and say, Lord, I did this, he can extend that mercy and that grace to us, and that blesses us and that helps us. But the enemy wants us to put up that wall. The enemy wants us to lie about it because he knows the kind of fellowship we can have if we're honest. He has compassion upon, upon us and our foibles. Yes, I did have to look up that word to see how to say it. <laughs> foibles, which means shortcoming in character or behavior. That's exactly what it means. Shortcoming in character or behavior. He is slow to anger. Though his wrath can be kindled to the point of region-destroying anger, he is not short-tempered. So that's something for us to say, man, if, if man, I've sinned, I'm going to make God angry at me. He's going to just wipe out me and my family. He's going to wipe out this and wipe out that. No, no, no. That's the enemy trying to discourage you from going to your God and being honest. That's all that is. So we must go to him, be honest, and you'll find that that's when the mercy and grace comes. How do you respond when your, child, when your children sin or fail? How do you respond? That's kind of big, a rhetorical question we could ask ourselves this morning. How do we respond when our children fail or sin? So the father praises publicly, praises, publicly endorses, and brags about his kids. Matthew 3.17 And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father publicly bragged about his child. The father told his son he loved him publicly. The father told every, everyone his son was doing a good job. Our kids should hear our praise regularly and feel our pride for them. I'm going to say that one again. Our kids should hear our praise regularly and feel our pride for them. Now, I will say some kids will hear more of the correction and the issues than they will the pride, than they will the praise. So it also is double fold. Parents need to make sure they're giving praise and, and lifting them up. But the children also need to be able to have an ear to hear it so that way they don't just always focus on the, neg the negative side. Well, I'm getting corrected about this. I'm getting corrected about that. I'm getting corrected about this. I'm getting corrected about that. And they forget that their parent just praised them five or six minutes ago about something they did well. So it's double fold. So we've got to be accurate in this. Amen. But we as parents, especially, it's easy to point out the bad things and not give any praise. So we've got to make sure we're making that effort to point out praise too. And of course, this is my pastor writing here. So he says, To my shame, my Lydia knew what disappointed meant before she understood what proud meant. Do your children feel the joy of your pride or only the shame of your disappointment? Again, another rhetorical question for us this morning. So God's commandments are not grievous or complicated. 1 John 5, 3. But 2, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and not, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The Father makes His expectations very clear. So should we. So if God is very clear in his communication and what he wants and expects, then we should be as well. So for our bullet points here, his expectations are very clear and so should we. The first bullet point says, come out, be separate, touch not, no fuss, no muss, no shifting standard. So when God put that standard out there, it was for everybody, you know, even, in, uh, even as we're told, there in 2 Corinthians, that we, when that standard is put out there, it's not only for the Corinthian church, but it's also for us today. So if that is standing true, that means that standard has not changed. It's standing the test of time. And so we as parents, although we're human, we're going to, be, we're going to make mistakes and things like that. But when we put a standard out there, we should be clear in it and not have it changed every couple of days. We should say, this is the standard. This is it. And if there needs to be an amendment, if there needs to be a change, then we say, all right, we, this has come up, so we've got to make an amendment to this standard. We've got to make an amendment to this guideline. So that way everybody's across the board understands it. Because if you change it in your mind and don't let anybody else know it, 
then you're setting people up for failure. So we should be clear and unchanging our expectations. Your children are designed to want to please you. Your children are designed to want to please you. Now, I have seen this in quite a few adults even because maybe there was a situation when they were growing up in their childhood that one of the parents weren't there or was barely there, things of that nature. And as they grow up, they're still trying to please that parent when they come around, which is, it's, it's sad in a way because if that parent, even if that parent, when, even when their child is an adult, still doesn't give them acknowledgement and still doesn't give them love, then that, sh- that, that would just keep cycling through until that adult child now overcomes that hurdle. And God forbid they pass that on to their children. But it needs to be taken care of properly and for somebody to break that cycle, somebody to say, you know what, I remember growing up this way, it stops with me, we're stopping it here, it's not going any further. And we're going to take care of this. But even with that kind of scenario, it shows that there is something inside every child that wants to please their parent, no matter the situation, no matter the, the outcome of what's going on. It's a, it's a heart cry of wanting that parent's love and wanting that parent's affection. So for we as parents or grandparents or spiritual parents, we should know that those, those that are, we consider our children or grandchildren, we, we should put that standard out there that they can help please us not to just be at our beck and call, but when we do ask of something from them, they know what that expectation is, and when they do a good job, we need to recognize that. We say, good job, I appreciate that, that's awesome. Because here's why. Do, don't, crush, don't crush that or you'll lose your kids. Because if your standard is so hard that they cannot obtain it, you will lose your kids. That beats them in their own. I just, I quit. I, I, I just not even want to try. Everything I've done, everything I continue to do, nothing's good enough. It's just, I, I just keep failing. So I just, I just quit. It's easier to quit than to keep doing this. And then not only will they, they may quit on you, but they may quit on God. Because how they view you is how they view God. Well, God's just too impossible. He's just too impossible. That has been the fruit of religious spirit in this region. God's just too impossible to please. I can't, I can't please him. I'm, just, I'm not even going to serve him at all. And that's not really the way God is. Right. Amen. Amen. Are your parental expectations like shifting sands, impossible to nail, or are they easy to grasp and accomplish? So again, another rhetorical question for us. It is not impossible to please God like some parents. He simply requires faith. So Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Not flawless works. That's something this region needs to hear. Because you have some, it's in a ditch, all about the hyper grace, where you don't have to do anything. You just say, Jesus is my Savior, God's my Father, and then you're good to go for the rest of your life. That's a bad ditch you don't want to be in, because that's heresy. Then you have the other side who says, well, as long as you do good things, you'll be all right and get into heaven. That's the opposite dish. We can't be in either one of those. We've got to be right down the middle. We should have faith that walks with God. And our faith, if it's true faith and true love for God, things are just going to come out of our life of us just serving God. Just the works will follow and the fruit will come out of us just because of a love and an honor for God. So it's faith. It's faith that pleases Him. Because if you have faith in something, one, you're going to have a love for it. But two, you're going to do things to build on that faith. You're going to do things to improve in that relationship. That's like your marriage. If you have faith in your marriage, you're going to do things to show your your love and appreciation for your spouse. And that's just going to keep flowing and keep building that relationship. But if somewhere that faith begins to break, then that relationship is going to deteriorate. So without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not flawless works. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So the Father requires us to come to him. The Father requires us to come to him. This is one of those things to where many people say, well, God, God, God will come to you where you're at. 
Like he'll lift you up out of the miry pit, out of the miry clay. He'll lift you up out of those things. But the coming to him in our sense is we've got to cry out to him. We've got to cry out to say, Father, I need you. And essentially, especially for us on this side of the cross, that's us going to God. That's us coming to him. And so he, that's where he meets us is when we begin to go to him, then he meets us maybe at the area where we're at in our life to help us and improve us and get, and get us in a better situation for our life. But it takes us getting on our knees, whether physically or spiritually, or humbling ourselves and crying out to him that we go to him. Just like the prodigal, just like the, the parable of the prodigal son where Jesus tells the, the father didn't go to where the son was. The son had to make his way back to the father. But when the son got so close to, to the, his father's house, that then is when the father ran out to meet him. But it wasn't close until he got to his house. So that's kind of the same situation is we cry out to God. We cry out. So that's us being the prodigal crying out to God Going back, to his, going back to his house, so to speak, and then the Father comes down the road to meet us and meets us maybe in our sinful lifestyle of where we're at to deliver us and to help us. But it takes us crying out to him first. So the Father is not looking for flawless works, but heart effort. Amen. You know, <laughs> the be- probably the best example I can give you of this is, you know, sometimes we as a family will color or some of the, maybe the boys will, will stop and they'll color or draw things and do things of that nature. You take Elijah, of course, I mean, he can draw like, you know, any artist. I mean, does a wonderful, you know, job. And, can, you know, of course, I mean, he's, he's, you know, 17, so he's doing a great job at that. And then you have Ty, who's 11, wonderful artist, far beyond his years, who can do things. And then you got Zach, who's just, he just now turned six. Well, his his picture now, you know, being as he's matured in that area, you can tell what it is for the most part, but it's not going to look as good as Ty's or look as good as Elijah's. Why? Because he's younger. He has less experience. But even with that heart of, look, Daddy, look, look what I drew you. Look what I've done for you. It's that heart that you recognize. It's not that the picture's perfect and it's just got, you know, every little mark is, you know, every little crayon mark is within the lines and everything looks all so perfect like you could sell it for a million dollars. It's the heart in it that says, look what I've done, Daddy, look what I've done. And, and, and it gives you that proud moment of saying, that's awesome, son, thank you so much, I appreciate that. And we take that and we, maybe we, we put it aside or we hang it up for a little while. But that's the way God does us. When we, when we do things for him, he's not looking for the perfect, the perfection of every jot and tittle. He's looking for the heart. Because if we have the heart for him, we're going to do it out of the right heart. And granted, we know biblical order, the way we should do things. So we, but we have the right heart for it. We can even make a mistake in witnessing to somebody doing something, some small mistake that we can make, you know, trying to do th- something for God. God will give grace over that and allow somewhere for that to be discipled to be more accurate. Because he sees that. He sees the heart. He sees the heart's there. We just got to help disciple to be a little more accurate in what they're doing. Amen. So we see that, and that's the way we should view our God. We should view our Father. So the Father rewards those that seek to please Him. Well, God never done nothing for me. Well, have you sought Him? Have you looked for Him? Have you cried out unto Him? Have you actually tried to follow Him and do things for Him? And that's the, the question I would say. Because you know, so every once in a while you get that kind of rough as a cob religious person who's, well, God nothing, done nothing for me, so I ain't doing nothing for Him. That's your first problem. You're expecting him to do first. When you should cry out to God. Because he's a rewarder of them that seek him. That diligently seek him. We should not look out for outward flawlessness, but inward tenderness. Now you got, We've got to be careful as Christians we don't fall prey to this. That we don't become outwardly and inwardly rugged because of the things of life. As I tell you, being a pastor and being a minister, for I've been preaching almost 17 years now. There's a lot of things in my life I could have got hard. 
I could have become a drill sergeant. I could be one big jerk of a preacher and would have every excuse. Now, excuses are not good. They're not permittable in God's eyes. But by man's standard, I could have every excuse to be that way. But because we serve God, because we love God, we say, Father, help me. I know that wasn't a pleasant situation, but help me to stay humble. Help my heart to be tender. And I can continue to serve you and to be a blessing to your people. And that's the way that we all should be as Christians. Not just ministers, not just pastors, but as Christians. Because there is no hurt like a church hurt. Amen. But we've, even through that hurt, we've got to have an inward tenderness. So we as parents should look for that inward tenderness as well. Just to, I want to go over a little bit of time here, but there's times where I can get on to the boys and, you know, you've got, you know, a couple of them, if, even if I mention, you know, spanking them or correcting them, one of them will start crying. Oh, I'm sorry, daddy. I'm sorry, daddy. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. And it's not that they're afraid of the paddle. It's that all I, sometimes all I got to do is just look at them and say, you shouldn't have done that. And tears come forward. Because it's that tenderness of the heart that realizes I've done wrong and I shouldn't have. It's not so much about the spanking. It's not so much about you know, the paddle or whatever. It's more that inward tenderness because they, they haven't allowed their heart to grow hard. And that's what we need to have. But we also need to have as parents what we need to look for in our children. That we don't make them hard or we don't allow life to make them hard. So we should eagerly reward our kids when they conform to our family's protocol and ex expectations. This requires balance. Do you overly reward or do you withhold even the tiniest reward of praise? So we've got to have a balance to this. Parents often fail Ephesians 6, 4, the Amplified Classic Version, says, Fathers, parents, do not irritate and provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to resentment. So one person shared with me their personal test story of pain and discouragement in their upbringing. My parent would tear me down, then never mend the relationship or address what I had done wrong. They had, they had cal after they had calmed down, they never repented or explained what they were mad about or comfort the pain that they had caused by their angry put-downs. I learned to comply in order to avoid the hurt of rejection, but I was never able to figure out what was wrong in the first place. Even after my repentance, my parent would still be angry with me and would not restore a loving relationship. I therefore grew up assuming God was the same way. He would always be holding something over me. That is a sad testimony to have. The previous testimony is the exact opposite of how God relates to us as His children. The exact opposite. It is not impossible to please God. He has a much bigger, he has a much, excuse me, much higher standard than mom and dad ever could. Parenting is designed to introduce our children to the nature of the love of God. If we fail to know it ourselves, we will present a false and potentially blasphemous image of God to our kids. Repent if this is you, and may the rest of us pray we never fall into this destructive behavior. Amen. Amen.